The exploration of North America dates back to about the year 1000. Eric the Red and later his son, Leif Erikson, journeyed from their Scandinavian homeland to Greenland and then on to what is now Nova Scotia. Nearly 500 years later, in 1492, Christopher Columbus made his transatlantic journeys, four in all, which took him from Europe to Cuba and other islands of the Caribbean Sea, and to lands along the coast of the Gulf of Mexico, now known as Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama. In 1493, Juan Ponce de Leon sailed with Christopher Columbus on his second journey to the Americas. Then, on his own in 1513, he sailed from Spain to Puerto Rico and continued northward to the next landfall. He was looking for the Fountain of Youth, but found only the subtropical beauty of Florida. He gave it its name for the many beautiful flowers he found there. Not long after Columbus, in 1497, John Cabot sailed under commission from King Henry VII of England to Newfoundland. At about the same time, Amerigo Vespucci of Florence, Italy, made two voyages that reached the shores of South America. A German mapmaker named the New World after Amerigo Vespucci. In 1510, Vasco Nunez de Balboa of Spain crossed the Atlantic and settled in what is now called Panama. He led an expedition westward and is thought to be the first European to see the Pacific Ocean from the western shores of the Americas. An Italian navigator and explorer, Giovanni de Verrazzano, commissioned by King Francis I, sailed in 1524 up the east coast of North America. He explored the areas around Cape Fear, North Carolina, and northward to New York and Narragansett Bay. A French navigator, Jacques Cartier, made three voyages to the North American coastline between 1534 and 1542. He explored the St. Lawrence Seaway and River, which is now the northern boundary between America and Canada. Cartier's reports of his journey stimulated more exploration. In 1539, Hernando de Soto landed on the South Florida coast near Tampa Bay. He advanced northward through the present states of Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas, following the ruthless practice of capturing the chief of an Indian village, holding him for ransom, and plundering the town of food and its women. After wintering in Florida, DeSoto's marauding force marched into Tennessee and Alabama, where many of his men were killed in a bloody battle with Indians. He made his way to Mississippi and northward to modern-day Memphis. He and his men are thought to be the first Europeans to see the expansive Mississippi River. They then continued south into Arkansas and made their winter camp near the Oklahoma-Arkansas border. From there, they returned to Mississippi where De Soto died in 1542. He failed in his primary goal of bringing fabulous riches to Spain, but he did succeed in blazing new trails throughout the southeastern part of North America. At about the same time in history, 1540, on the other side of the continent, another Spanish explorer, Francisco Vasquez de Coronado, was leading an expedition from Mexico, northward into what is now modern Arizona and New Mexico. He also was searching for riches. He explored the pueblos of the Zuni Indian tribe. Finding no wealth, he pushed northeastward into what is now Kansas. Finding nothing, he returned discouraged, but the vast wilderness that his expedition covered is considered to be one of the greatest explorations of the New World. Also on the west coast, a Portuguese navigator, Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo, was part of the Pedro de Alvarado party exploring the west coast of Mexico. When Alvarado died, Cabrillo took command and sailed north, discovering San Diego Bay, Santa Catalina Island, Port Reyes, and Monterey Bay. On the return trip, he died and is buried on San Miguel Island in the Santa Barbara Channel. One of the most famous explorers of the 16th century was Sir Francis Drake. He is the second man following Ferdinand Magellan to lead an expedition around the world. The journey, which began in 1577 with the financial backing of Queen Elizabeth, proved disastrous. 
By the time he had reached the Pacific Ocean, by way of the treacherous passage around the southern tip of South America, his five ships had been reduced in number to only one, the Golden Hind. He traveled north, raiding Spanish shipping on his way. His most significant landfall in North America was in the San Francisco area. He claimed the Bay Area for England and named it New Albion. He then set sail across the Pacific, returning to England by way of the Indian Ocean and the Cape of Good Hope. He returned a hero and was knighted by the Queen for his accomplishments. Samuel de Champlain, a French navigator and map maker, traveled to North America 12 times between the years 1603 and 1633. He successfully and very accurately charted and mapped the Atlantic seaboard from the Bay of Fundy to Cape Cod. Chaplain's purpose in coming to North America was fourfold. To spread the gospel message of Christianity, to promote trade in fur and other commodities, to establish colonies, and the larger goal, to find a route through the continent to Asia. His travels took him to all the waterways that now form the border between Canada and the United States. Lake Champlain, that separates upstate New York and Vermont, bears his name. The work of Champlain was continued in the 17th century by Henry Hudson, who attempted to find the Northwest Passage, a route through the North American continent from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. Working for the Dutch East India Company in 1609, Hudson sailed his ship, the Half Moon, up the Hudson River as far as Albany, New York. He claimed the area for the Dutch, and the river was named in his honor. Failing to find the Northwest Passage, he made another attempt in 1610. He wintered in the Hudson Bay area before going on, but his crew mutinied and set he and a few men loyal to him adrift at sea in a small boat, never to be seen again. The next great challenge of the 17th century was to explore the Great Western River, spoken of by the Indians. French-Canadian Louis Joliet and his companion, Father Jacques Marquette, a Jesuit priest, led this journey in 1673. Traveling down the Fox River and the Wisconsin River, they reached the Great Mississippi. They traveled as far south as the Memphis region before turning back, convinced the Mississippi flowed all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. Marquette's journals, maps, and correspondence give us a clear record of his missionary activities and explorations of the Great Lakes and Upper Mississippi regions. Joliet went on to make further explorations of the Lower St. Lawrence, Labrador, and the Hudson Bay. He made many useful maps and charts of the area. The first European to navigate the Mississippi River all the way from the north to the Gulf of Mexico was a Frenchman, René Robert Cavalier Saud de La Salle. As commandant of Fort Frontenac on Lake Ontario, La Salle was charged with the development of the fur trade in the area. He expanded on this mission due to his deep desire to be an explorer. He journeyed in 1679 to Lake Michigan. And in 1682, from the Illinois River down the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico. On a subsequent journey, he was to lay claim for France to the territory that he named Louisiana. The expedition was a failure he never rediscovered the Mississippi Delta. And to make matters worse, he was murdered by rebellious men under his command in Texas in 1687. Captain James Cook, a British navigator, is considered to be the greatest explorer of the 18th century. Following military service, Cook commanded the schooner Grenville, spending four years beginning in 1763, surveying the coasts of Labrador, Newfoundland, and Nova Scotia. He was a master of navigation and a fine map maker. His charts were considered accurate and important and were used by other seamen. In 1768, and again in 1772, Cook led expeditions to the South Pacific. 
he visited various exotic tropical islands like Tahiti. He circumnavigated New Zealand, proving it to be an island rather than a continent, and he surveyed the eastern seaboard of Australia. Sailing again on his ship, the Resolution, in 1776, he went in search of the elusive Northwest Passage from the Pacific side. He visited familiar waters in the South Pacific and traveled north, discovering Christmas Island, it being Christmas when he arrived there, and then on to the Hawaiian Islands, which he named the Sandwich Islands, then on to North America. The resolution made landfall in the Seattle, Washington, Vancouver, British Columbia areas. From there, Cook went through the Bering Strait into the Arctic Ocean, but found nothing but ice and no Northwest Passage. Cook returned to Hawaii for repairs. It was there he died. Captain James Cook surveyed and charted thousands of miles of coast and solved many of the mysteries of the South Pacific. He also opened the Northwest American coast to trade and colonization. Another explorer who searched for the Northwest Passage was Jonathan Carver. He was an American born in Massachusetts who spent much of his life exploring the Great Lakes region. In 1778, he published an account of his experiences, his travels through the interior parts of North America. He never found the Northwest Passage. It wasn't until the 20th century that a Norwegian explorer in the early 1900s successfully navigated the Northwest Passage from the east coast of Canada through to Nome, Alaska. The Northwest Passage never developed as a commercial trade route early explorers thought it would be. One of America's most famous pioneers is Daniel Boone. He was born in 1734 to Quaker parents in Pennsylvania. As a young man, his family settled in North Carolina. He came to prominence in the 1760s for his explorations and hunting expeditions in the Kentucky wilderness. In 1769, Richard Henderson, an ambitious investor who ran a business called the Transylvania Company, bought from the Indians much of the land that is now Kentucky and Tennessee. He hired Boone to blaze a trail to establish settlements in the region. During the Revolutionary War, Boone helped the Kentucky settlements as a hunter and as an Indian fighter. He was captured by the Shawnee Indians in 1778, but managed to escape. Boone's bravery brought him fame throughout the East and abroad. He was even elected to the Kentucky legislature. He was immortalized in the poem, Don Juan by Lord Byron, and myths circulated about his exploits. When he died in 1820, he was one of America's most famous frontier heroes. Robert Gray was an American navigator. He was the first seaman to carry the American flag around the world. In May of 1792, Gray sailed his ship, the Columbia, into the mouth of what is now called the Columbia River, which forms the boundary between Oregon and Washington. His discovery established the basis of America's claim to the Oregon Territory. Much of the American wilderness was explored by rugged individuals like William Shirley Williams, a mountain man and trapper. At age 16, young Williams went to live with the Indians. He spent 25 years living among the Osage tribe. He served the army as an interpreter and scout. In 1845 and 1848, he was part of John C. Fremont's expeditions. More on Fremont's accomplishments later. Williams, even though he had lived with the Osage, died at the hands of Indians in 1849. The most important expedition of the 19th century was undertaken by Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. Contrary to the popular notion that they were charged with exploring the Louisiana Purchase, it was indeed the vast area they explored, but their expedition was planned well in advance of the Louisiana Purchase. President Jefferson handpicked Lewis and Clark. Meriwether Lewis, following his army duty, served as President Jefferson's personal secretary from 1801 to 1803. William Clark, also a former army officer, was Lewis's close and trusted friend. Their purpose, in the words of Jefferson, 
was to find the water communication across this continent. In other words, a route by water linking the Mississippi River and the Pacific Ocean. In addition, they were charged with mapping the territories they explored, holding diplomatic meetings with the Indian tribes they encountered, and studying plant and animal life they observed in their travels. They set off on their history-making journey May 14, 1804 from St. Louis, Missouri. Their vehicle was a 55-foot keelboat and two smaller boats, carrying a total of 45 men and tons of provisions including corn, pork, whiskey, gunpowder, carpentry tools, medicine, blankets, tents, and gifts for Indian tribes such as mirrors, combs, earrings, and fish hooks. Heading north, their plan was to travel up the Missouri River as far as the Rocky Mountains by winter, cover what they considered to be a short distance between the Missouri and Columbia Rivers, and then descend the Columbia to the Pacific, reaching their objective by fall of 1805. Traveling north on the Missouri River proved more difficult than they expected, however, and by November they had gone only as far as central North Dakota. The winter of 1804 was spent with the Mandan Indians. Here they gathered information on the lands that lay before them. And it was here they met Sacagawea. She was a Shoshone Indian who became very important to their success. She had come to North Dakota from Shoshone country with her husband, a French fur trader. She was pregnant, and Meriwether Lewis, having some medical training, served as her midwife when she gave birth. Lewis and Clark hired Sacagawea's husband as an interpreter, and she came along with the expedition as a guide to lands familiar to her. Her presence with the baby reassured Indians they encountered on their way that they were not a war party. The next leg of their trip took three months, from April to July of 1805. They covered the ground between the Mandan village and the three forks of the Missouri River. The most difficult part of the journey lay ahead, crossing the Rockies. They purchased horses from the Shoshones, stashed their canoes and headed off into the hills. The path they took crossed the Bitterroot Range of the Rockies in Montana into northern Idaho. The torturous three-month ordeal of crossing the Rockies nearly killed Lewis and Clark. It left men and horses weakened and sick, in need of a long rest before continuing. In the words of Meriwether Lewis from his journal, the pleasure I now felt in triumphing over the Rocky Mountains can be more readily conceived than expressed. The final leg of the trip began in October of 1805. They followed the Clearwater River to the Snake, which they followed to the Columbia River. The Columbia led them to their goal, the Pacific Ocean. At the mouth of the Columbia, at modern-day Astoria, Oregon, they built their winter headquarters at Fort Clatsop. After a four-month rest, they set out on the return trip in March of 1806, retracing their steps to the Rockies. There, Lewis took part of the party down the Missouri River, and Clark led the rest of the party down the Yellowstone River. They rejoined on August 12, 1806, on the Missouri River and returned together to St. Louis on September 23, 1806, a full year later than they had planned. Lewis and Clark had covered more than 8,000 miles. Their journals and maps charted unknown lands. They interacted with dozens of Indian tribes, and they wrote the first scientific descriptions of 178 plants and 122 animals. They never met their central objective, finding a water route from the Mississippi to the Pacific. But they did prove the objective was a myth. And in the process, they pioneered the overland route to the Pacific across the Rocky Mountains. A huge blank space on the map of North America had been filled. William Clark was appointed Superintendent of Indian Affairs in 1807. He also served as Governor of Missouri Territory. 
Meriwether Lewis was appointed governor of Louisiana Territory in 1806, a post he filled until his death in 1809. In contrast to giants of exploration like Lewis and Clark, there are many minor contributors like Lieutenant Zebulon Montgomery Pike. In 1806, he was sent by his commanding general out west to explore the headquarters of the Arkansas River and descend the Red River. Pike, being a strange mix of courageous and incompetent, got lost. He and his men suffered from cold and hunger. In southeastern Colorado, they made an unsuccessful attempt to climb the mountain that now bears his name, Pike's Peak. From there, he strayed up and down the Arkansas River, but failed to find the Red River. He ended up encamped on a branch of the Rio Grande in Spanish territory, was arrested by a Spanish detachment, and finally escorted to the U.S. border and released. Pike was killed in the War of 1812. Major Stephen Harriman Long, like Lieutenant Pike before him, reported Colorado to be uninhabitable. Despite this lack of judgment, he did make contributions to Western exploration. He was the first to use steamboats on the Missouri River, having designed a shallow draft steamboat suited for shallow draft river navigation. He was the first white man to see the tallest of the Rocky Mountains. It now bears his name, Long's Peak. He led a total of five expeditions for the U.S. Army between 1816 and 1823, mapping and surveying as he went. He was well suited for detail and discipline, having come from West Point as an assistant professor of mathematics. Despite the fact that Long covered approximately 26,000 miles during his service, probably more than any other government explorer, he is almost forgotten to history. Lewis and Clark truly blazed the trail that opened the West to dozens of intrepid individuals looking for opportunity and wealth. The fur trade promised the greatest rewards, specifically the fur of the beaver, treasured by East Coast men and women for their hats and coats. Manuel Lisa was one of those to follow in Lewis and Clark's footsteps. In Lisa's case, almost literally. He led a large party of trappers up the Missouri River and down the Yellowstone to the mouth of the Bighorn. Here, he built a fort and conducted a fur trading business for a half dozen years. Encouraged by Lee's success, General William Ashley and partner Andrew Henry placed this ad in 1823. For the Rocky Mountains, the subscribers wished to engage 100 men to ascend the Missouri to the Rocky Mountains there to be employed as hunters. As a compensation to each man fit for such business, $200 per annum will be given for his services. The ad attracted men whose names would go down in history. Rugged mountain men like Jim Bridger and Jedediah Smith. Theirs was a hard and dangerous life, but the lure of money for the fur of the beaver was strong. Drawn by the prospect of wealth, it was men like these who blazed new trails throughout the far west. Jim Bridger is the personification of the frontiersman. His exploits were so outrageous that they were disbelieved until others found them to be true. In 1824, he discovered the Great Salt Lake with its saline waters, and later, Yellowstone with its geysers and mud pots. His reports of these phenomena were at first ridiculed as tall stories. Jedediah Smith quickly rose to the status of captain in the Trapper Brigades. He packed a lifetime of experiences into a 12-year period. In 1826, he went searching for the mythical Buena Ventura River and became the first white man to traverse the land from the Rockies to California. He also was the first to cross the Great Basin the first to cross the Sierra Nevadas from west to east, and the first to venture overland from Southern California to the Pacific Northwest. This was his most remarkable journey through the Mojave Desert in 1827, north through the California mountains to the Millinette Valley, Oregon by 1828, then east across the mountains to the Flathead River of Montana, 
and south in 1829 to Pierre's Hole, Idaho. His life was cut short just two years later when he was killed by Comanche Indians while leading a wagon train to Santa Fe, New Mexico. The fur trade also attracted Captain Benjamin Bonneville, a French-born U.S. Army officer. While his orders call for collecting information on geography, geology, and topography, Captain Bonneville pursued the fur trade. He joined forces with veteran mountain man Joe Walker in the summer of 1833. Bonneville sent Walker off to find a trail from Utah to California. Walker's route followed the Humboldt River to the Sierras, which they crossed in a terrible 20-day trek. They became the first white man to see the beauty of what is now Yosemite National Park. Bonneville sent Walker off to find a trail from Utah to California. They proceeded on to Monterey, where they were warmly welcomed by the native inhabitants. On the return trip, they followed a different route and found what became known as Walker Pass, the gateway through the Southern Sierras, which became a major immigrant trail into California. The fur trade did indeed contribute greatly to the exploration of the West. One of the big money interests in the fur trade was John Jacob Astor. Astor was one of those who lost his life when the Titanic sank in 1912. While financial gain was a big motivator in westward expansion, so was scientific inquiry. Lieutenant Charles Wilkes commanded a squadron of six ships in 1838 in what is recognized as one of the U.S. Navy's finest accomplishments in peacetime during the Age of Sail. Aboard the U.S. flagship Vincennes, Commander Wilkes charted 800 miles of North American continent between the Canadian-U.S. boundary and San Francisco. On the same four-year expedition between 1838 and 1842, Wilkes explored Antarctica and about 300 Pacific Islands, including the Hawaiian Islands. He brought home hundreds of specimens of plant and animal life and valuable other scientific reports. He constructed 180 maps and charts, one of which, the map of the Oregon Territory, was declared by the Secretary to the Navy to alone be worth the cost of the expedition. At about the time Charles Wilkes was mapping the Oregon coast by sea, John Charles Fremont was exploring Oregon by land. Fremont was a soldier, politician, and explorer who charted the least known parts of the West. In 1841, he married Jesse Benton, the 18-year-old daughter of the influential U.S. Senator Thomas Hart Benton. In the years 1843 and 1844, Fremont's party made a massive circle through the uncharted lands, from the Colorado Rockies, north to the South Pass, northwest to the Columbia River, south along the Cascade and Sierra Nevada ranges, into California and southward before turning east across the desert to the vicinity of Salt Lake City and then east across the Colorado Rockies to St. Louis, Missouri. He dispelled the myth of the San Buenaventura River, which was said to flow from the Rockies to California, and he demonstrated that the South Pass was the best route across the mountains. In 1845, Fremont returned to California, where he encouraged American settlers to revolt against Mexican rule and establish their own Bear Flag Republic. It was named a territory in 1847, and California was admitted to the Union in 1850 as the 31st state. In 1850-1851, Fremont served a two-year term as U.S. Senator from the new state of California. 
1856, he ran for president, unsuccessfully as the first presidential candidate for the Republican Party. One of the men who served under John Fremont was Kit Carson, a true American frontiersman, mountain man and explorer. Christopher Kit Carson spent 15 years roaming the Rocky Mountains as a fur trapper before becoming a guide for Fremont in Oregon and California. During the Mexican War, Carson carried dispatches for John Fremont. During the Civil War, he served as a colonel in the New Mexico Volunteers. Edward Fitzgerald Beale, like Kit Carson, was another dispatch carrier during the Mexican War. As such, he crossed the continent six times. In 1848, he brought the first official news of the discovery of gold in California to the East Coast. Beale was not just a courier. He served as a naval officer under Commodore Robert Stockton in California during the Mexican War. After leaving the Navy in 1851, he was an Indian agent and a Western surveyor. In 1876, he was appointed U.S. Minister to Austria and Hungary. Another notable scientific explorer was John James Audubon. The French-American naturalist is most famous for his study and paintings of birds in America. He traveled extensively throughout mid-America sketching and painting birds and other animals. By 1838, he had completed more than 400 paintings. The Audubon Society was named for him. Still another important scientific explorer was John Wesley Powell, a one-armed Civil War veteran seen here with the chief of the Paiute Indian tribe. Powell, a genealogist and anthropologist, was a college professor at Illinois Wesleyan University. Financed by the Smithsonian Institution, he explored the Green and Colorado River canyons, studied and classified the languages of various American Indian tribes, and laid the groundwork for irrigation and conservation projects. While not a true explorer, Davy Crockett cannot be overlooked as one of America's most colorful frontiersmen and folk heroes. Coming from a poor pioneer family, he picked up the skills of hunter, scout, and woodsman. He served in 1813 to 1814 under Andrew Jackson in the wars against the Creek Indians. He was elected to U.S. Congress and earned a reputation as an amusing, shrewd, and outspoken backwoodsman. He died on March 6, 1836, defending the Alamo during the Texas Revolution. Like Davy Crockett, Jim Bowie, another defender of the Alamo, was a rugged frontiersman. During the 1820s, he prospered in land and lumber speculations and is said to have trafficked in slaves. Bowie became famous as a knife duelist, and the massive knife he had specially made for him is called the Bowie knife. During the Battle of the Alamo, he broke his hip and was confined to bed. When the Mexicans finally swarmed into the room where he lay, it said he killed nine of them with his knife before being overpowered. Following the Mexican War and the Oregon Boundary Settlement, the boundaries of the United States were defined from coast to coast. Accurate surveys became essential in order to organize these vast new areas and territories to set geopolitical boundaries and to identify and catalog their resources. The government called on West Point and the U.S. Army Corps of Topographical Engineers eventually to become the Corps of Engineers. Between 1840 and the outbreak of the Civil War in 1860, virtually every region west of the Mississippi was probed and examined. One of these West Point men was Lieutenant William H. Emory. He surveyed the boundary between Mexico and the United States, a task that took six years to complete. From 1849 to 1855, Emory and his party compiled exhaustive data on geography, geology, plant and animal life, and native Indians of the region. 
Harvard botanist Asa Gray praised the work as the most important publication of the kind that has ever appeared. Another young topographical engineer was Lieutenant George Horatio Derby. In 1850, he commanded a party that explored the Colorado and Gila rivers and established the true relationship of the two bodies of water. Derby was a cartoonist and satirist. He wrote humorous articles about the topographical engineers illustrated with his cartoons. Derby's most important work, however, was laying the groundwork that led to upriver explorations of the Colorado by Lieutenant Joseph Ives that came seven years later. Ives led a party of explorers up the Colorado by paddle wheeler, discovering the splendor of the canyons carved out by the river over millions of years. The first European to see the Grand Canyon was the Spanish explorer Garcia Lopez de Gardinas back in 1540. But Ives and his men became the first white man to see it from the floor of the canyon in 1858. The government-sponsored Western expeditions of the mid-1800s in many cases were accompanied by a naturalist from the Smithsonian Institution of Washington. Thanks to Spencer Fullerton Baird, the Smithsonian's very ambitious secretary, the U.S. Army explorations did not get underway before Baird at least gave their commander instructions on how to collect specimens or, in ideal cases, took a Smithsonian scientist along. The U.S. Geological Survey was formed after the Civil War and beginning in 1867, parties like this one, led by Ferdinand Hayden, thoroughly explored and mapped the western part of the continent. There were four great western expeditions. The Hayden expedition covered an area that includes Idaho, southern Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, and Nebraska. The Hayden exploration took 11 years from 1867 to 1878. From 1867 to 1872, Clarence King led the 40th Parallel Survey. King was one of the most capable of the West's explorers. He was an accomplished mountaineer as well as a surveyor. King's five-year expedition covered Nevada, parts of Northern California around Lake Tahoe, Northern Utah, Colorado, Southern Wyoming, and Southern Idaho. John Wesley Powell led the third of the Great Western Surveys. From 1869 to 1879, he and his men surveyed and mapped the area that includes Utah, Southern Nevada, and Northern Arizona, including the Grand Canyon. Powell traversed the waters of the Colorado downriver through the Grand Canyon. Following his retirement from exploration, Powell was named director of the U.S. Geological Survey. The fourth of the great U.S. Geological Surveys was another 10-year outing, led by Lieutenant George Montague Wheeler, the last of the West Point U.S. Army explorers. Wheeler's party explored and mapped a huge portion of the American West, including California, Nevada, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona. These and many other brave explorers opened the West. After gold was discovered in California in 1850 and following the Civil War, the migration West began in earnest. The completion of the cross-continental rail lines in the last decades of the 1800s made travel relatively easy. The age of the Pathfinder had ended. Only one American landscape remained to be explored, Alaska. In 1867, America purchased Alaska from Russia for $7.2 million. It was William H. Seward, Secretary of State, who persuaded Congress to make the purchase. And it was Spencer Baird of the Smithsonian who persuaded Seward it was the deal of the century. Although many called it Seward's Folly, or the Polar Bear Garden, or Seward's Icebox, Spencer Baird knew the region had great natural resources and huge potential. One of Alaska's early explorers was Robert Kennicott, a Smithsonian naturalist shown here with fellow Smithsonian scientists. With the cooperation of the Hudson Bay Company, which had many outposts in Alaska, Kennicott made maps and collected specimens of flora and fauna, which he sent back to Baird. Kennicott worked 
diligently from 1859 to 1866, but the Alaskan winters proved to be too much for Kennecott. His frozen body was found not far from this port in Nulato on the Yukon River. He died, presumably of a heart attack at the early age of 30. Kennecott's work was taken up by his friend, William H. Dahl. The work Kennecott began, Dahl finished. Together, the two men logged thousands of miles throughout the icy wilderness of Alaska, mapping, laying telegraph lines, befriending the natives, and paving the way for those who followed. No one did more to promote Alaska than John Muir, the naturalist and national spokesman on preservation who did much to raise public awareness of Yosemite, now had a new love. After his first visit, he wrote, Alaska is one of the most wonderful countries in the world. By the turn of the century, the exploration of America was complete. But inquisitive Americans with a taste for adventure looked for new frontiers. The Arctic and the Antarctic have been studied by many Americans. Robert E. Perry, Matthew A. Henson, and Richard Evelyn Byrd are just a few of the most notable. In 1913, Hudson Stuck climbed North America's highest mountain, Mount McKinley, in Alaska. The oceans of the world are being mapped and studied under the sponsorship of institutions of higher learning. And, of course, space. Our next great adventure is being systematically probed by NASA. We have commit. We have, we have liftoff. Liftoff at 7.51 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have cleared the top. Tower clear, 13 seconds. Our astronauts are the modern day.